Thank you, Rhoda. Um, I want to warn it just as um, our text is 1 Peter 3, 18 to 22, but I want to uh, let the people know that are watching on the video that um, I'm intentionally going to stop it partway through because I know from my notes I'm probably going to go over 25 minutes. So uh, not much, but enough that I'm going to in intentionally set a break. Um, so that it's not in a really weird spot like it always seems to be. So, um, 1 Peter 3, 18-22 says, For doing what, for Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. How many of you know who Vinko Bogataj is? I'd have been shocked if somebody threw their hand up and said, I know, I know, I know. You all know who he is, or most all of you probably know who he is. You just don't realize that you know who he is. It's not a very familiar name for us, but for those who grew up watching the, the wide world of sports, you may not know his name, but you're familiar with his infamous accomplishment. He's the ski jumper who, during the introduction of the show, takes a nasty fall as the announcer speaks of the agony of defeat. Thankfully, his injuries weren't too serious, and he's become quite a celebrity here in the United States, even if we don't know his name. So in some ways, we might say that he turned the agony of defeat into the thrill of victory. And this morning, it's my hope that we're going to be able to do that in our life in a much more significant and an important way uh, than he was able to do. That when we're done, we're going to look at and be able to, to say um, that God has provided ways for us to turn the agony of defeat into the thrill of victory. Our text this morning is considered among the hardest to understand in the Bible. If you were following along and you were going, huh? That's normal. That's to be anticipated. Not only do we have Peter doing his best imitation of Paul with the run-on sentences, but you get down and you go, I don't even know what I just read. I don't know what Peter's trying to say. I don't understand this. Um, and whenever you have difficult to understand passages of the scripture, when you start going out and looking for how do other people understand it, it's not surprising to find that there's a whole lot of interpretations and a whole lot of ideas about how this should be taken care of. Um, and the biggest problem that most people have are their details trying to piece together the details of what do they say and what do they mean. And I admit that much of my explanation this morning is going to be spent on the details, but I want to examine them this morning through the filter and the understanding of Peter's main point. Peter's main point is simple, and it's found in verse 18. And his main point is this, when I follow Jesus... He transforms my suffering in the flesh into triumph in the spirit. And that's the filter upon which we're going to look at all these other pieces. This passage is the beginning of a section where Peter shows the contrast between what we experience in the flesh and what we experience spiritually. Spiritually. 
Once again, he's going to go back to the example of Jesus to make his point. So not surprisingly, this entire passage is primarily about Christ and how he made it possible for us to turn the agony of defeat, which occurs in the physical realm, into the thrill of victory in the spiritual realm. The first and last verses of this passage seem quite clear, and so we'll begin our examination there. In the flesh, Jesus procured my salvation through his suffering. That's what verse 18 begins telling us. At the end of the passage last week, Peter wrote in verse 17, it's better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. And then in verse 18, Peter returns to Christ, to that example that we have, who certainly suffered for doing good rather than doing for evil. And there are several important facts about Jesus suffering that though he doesn't state them directly, they're certainly summarized in some degree in what he's saying here. Jesus suffered once, unlike the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, what the people would still be trying to live under had Jesus not come. But also, even as Peter's writing this, there were still some who felt that was the system they were supposed to be living under. He suffered for sins. Mine, not his. Jesus took my place. Because I'm unrighteous, I deserve to be judged for my sins, but Jesus, who was completely righteous, took that judgment upon himself in my place. The purpose was to bring me to God. And that was all accomplished by being put to death in the flesh. From the world's perspective, what happened to Jesus in the flesh was undoubtedly the agony of defeat. Which is why even those who had been closest to him were in great despair after his death. By the time we get to the end of this passage in verse 22, however, we see how God turned that into the thrill of victory. In the flesh, in the spirit, Jesus proved his triumph through his resurrection and ascension. That's what verse 22 tells us. So if we look at this passage this morning, it's kind of like a sandwich. We've looked at the two pieces of bread. We've got 18 and 22. And if Peter had left out the middle, this would be a whole lot shorter sermon and a whole lot easier for us to understand. But he didn't. His teaching in verses 18 and verses 22 are quite clear. They would be consistent with the main theme that I've already identified When I follow Jesus, he transforms my suffering in the flesh into triumph in the spirit. Jesus suffered and he died in the flesh, but because he was faithful in fulfilling God's purpose, God turned that suffering into triumph in the spiritual realm. So the clear implication here is that if I follow Jesus' example and and I submit myself to his plan for my life, he will do the very same thing for me that he did For everyone else, he will transform whatever suffering I might experience in the flesh into into a spiritual triumph. He will turn the agony of defeat into the thrill of victory. But those aren't the only two verses we have to look at this morning. We've got the second half of 18, 19, 20, and 21. And so with that in mind, I want to look at briefly at that middle section that is so hard. In the spirit, Jesus proclaimed his triumph. That's verses 18 to 21. In some of our English Bible translations, the word spirit at the end of verse 18 is is translated with a capital S, which would make it a reference to the Holy Spirit. Now, The fascinating thing about studying languages, especially ancient dead languages like Greek and Hebrew, 
is that way back then they didn't have capitalization, they didn't have punctuation, the English teachers in the room would have all kinds of issues with, with studying these languages because when they wrote them, they wrote them as a run-on thing and, you, and, and people who knew the language could pick out the words just because they knew them and they could, it made sense to them and whether they were reading it this way or this way, it didn't matter because one of them you read it right to left, the other one you read left to right. So looking at it in its original, we don't know whether the, the word should be capitalized or written with a small s. But I believe that in my New American Standard, it's translated correctly with a small s, which would make it a reference to the human spirit of Jesus, not the godly spirit of Jesus. And that's a big difference. Though I will tell you in my Bible, there's a footnote on that word that says that it may or may not be capitalized because when they translated it, they didn't know whether it should be. And it seems to be consistent with the overall context of Peter's letter that carries over into chapter 4 where Peter is going to continue this contrast of flesh and spirit. Why am I making such a big deal about whether that's capitalized or not? Because... How we understand it makes a big difference about whether we're talking about the spirit of God or the spirit of man. And that's why I took two minutes or three minutes to explain that capitalization. And it was in his spirit, in his spirit, that Jesus went and proclaimed something to the spirits in prison, according to verse 19. And we've now arrived at the toughest part in this text. I'm going to explain it the very best I know how. If you take any time and you do any study on this passage, you're going to undoubtedly find that there are many men that are much more learned and educated than me that have different opinions on this. But after a number of hours of study and prayer over this, I hope what I'm sharing, it's my belief that what I'm sharing is the best explanation of how I understand things to occur and what they mean, what these pieces mean. And you can sit there and say, well, that's good, Pastor. That's your concept of it. Um, I'm also trusting that, that it's the truth as God's laid it out. Um, and if I'm wrong, I trust that he will have all of us forget whatever those parts are. And it's at this point I'm going to take a break that was scheduled and then we'll restart the second half of it and 